most businesses will eventually face the hurdles of accessing capital. Our guests will talk about ways to finance your business. That's today on our show, Show Me the Money. We've talked a little bit about accessing capital for your company, but there are some things that you should be thinking about before you access capital, and that is profits. So, planning your profits, making sure you're in a good place is important. Sarah, does SPAM have any information for owners who are looking at capital? Yes, we know this is an important topic for our small business owner members, so we worked with Gordon Advisors, a CPA firm here in Michigan, to create the Owner's Profit Planning Guide. Excellent. Uh, so what kinds of information can be found in this guide? This guide will really walk you through the benefits of preparing your profit plan and, uh, and talk about how to prepare it. So what makes a good profit plan effective? What's, the, uh, what's your financial analysis? We'll talk about profitability, asset management, your sales analysis, and product profitability. It'll even go into a SWOT analysis and allow you to create goals and action plans. Well, we appreciate you preparing that for us. Uh, how much does this guide cost? It's free, and you can find it at sbam.org. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Lisa Smith, and this is Focus on Business. Here with me today is Constance Logan and Tim Jewell. Thank you both for being here. Thank you, Lisa. Um, asking for money, even in the form of a loan, it can be complex and difficult. Let's break it down a little bit, make it easier. Let's start off with, what are the things that businesses are struggling with the most? Well, this, the title is quite appropriate because access to capital is certainly one of the things that business owners struggle with. And also access to talent, employees. Those are the two main items that we see. And how are those two things tied together? They're tied together because, of course, access to um, capital, the business needs it to be fully operational. And in terms of talent, they need money to provide salaries to those employees, et cetera, benefits, so they all tie nicely together. Right, and in this tight talent economy, people are offering more benefits. That's right. That's more expensive. Wages are going up if you want to keep the people that you have, That's you're going right. to pay them more. Right. So all of this is tied with even just running your business today, not even necessarily expansion. Correct. Yeah, so um, there's lots of ways that you can access capital as an owner. There are new, non-traditional ways that we're seeing today. Everything is digitized and ev there's all kinds of new things. Uh, so what are some of these new funding mechanisms that you're seeing, Tim? There's a number of ways that a business can uh, can access uh, uh, capital. Um, in addition to the traditional, say, bank uh, you know bank financing method, um, there is uh, crowdfunding, various forms of venture capital. Um, sometimes there are, are uh, angel, angel investors um, is one form of that, or a more uh, a more organized uh, uh, venture capitalist. Uh, and for a lot of small businesses, um, they are self-financed or financed um, within a, a very tight knit group of people, often friends and family loans are how businesses get going and, and, are, in, 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 and are able to, can, uh, to grow, at least provide some of the capital uh, to grow. So oftentimes it's, it's people that are very close to the organization. Yeah, and you mentioned these kinds of non-traditional sources. They sound to me, and, and I'm not an expert in this world, like uh, perhaps better options for a startup or a very early stage business. For a second stage business, I, from what I understand, it's a lot more uh, common to be accessing more traditional kinds of capital. So from a banking perspective, what kinds of options are available? Yeah, well I think you're absolutely right. The, uh, whether it be the crowdfunding or the venture capital, um, often more uh, expensive and probably not as maybe reliable as traditional financing, but it might be the only option to get somebody, uh, to get somebody up and going. Uh, but to get to, to get to that next phase, um, more traditional financing is gonna be less expensive, um, I think more, uh, probably more reliable, you can plan, plan it out better. So um, bank financing is certainly, you know, in this, that's the, the part, of the, uh, part of the business that I come from, is that very traditional bank loan, um, you know, way to raise, uh, way to raise capital. 
Right. Um, one of the things that banks offer in terms of a product is an SBA loan. Constance, you happen to know a little bit about this. I do. Uh, can you tell us what, give, give us a good uh, round, what are, what are the offerings from the SBA? Sure, sure. I'm really glad that uh, Tim is here today because the SBA, we really work with the banks. So the SBA, we lend, we guarantee the loan. We don't loan directly, so we have to use the banks. So the borrower has to go to the bank initially to request a loan. And in some cases, the borrower doesn't need an SBA guarantee, but there are issues like um, collateral is insufficient, um, they haven't been around as long, so then the bank will actually step in. We guarantee the loan, to, we guarantee the loan, and so the small business owner will get access to capital. In many cases, they can't get access to capital if they don't use an SBA guarantee. But if they can, we encourage them to go commercial. Because, you know, our deal is we want you to get the small business loan. We, and that's our 7A loan program, which deals with working capital, um, capital expansion. In terms of buying a building, we have a great loan program called a 504 loan program. So if you want to purchase a building, it's 25 years, we use the CDC, and you only put down 10%. So it's a great way for a small business owner to get the opportunities that they need without uh, going to a commercial lender and having a guarantee. Uh, the SBA, I'm hearing uh, there's a new, n new to me, product uh, in the micro range. Can you talk about those? What are, what are some of the, the levels of borrowing? Uh, you know, this is, we're talking about, you know, small business, 500 employees or less. Mm -hmm. What are, like, what are, the, what are the thresholds or the minimums that we're talking about for SBA? Well, the max we can go to is five, five million, but we have uh, 250,000. That's one of our loan programs. Um, but in terms of our micro loan, a lot of people don't know about micro loan programs, which is great for the small business owner. It starts at 5,000 and goes to 50,000. Now the SBA, they don't come directly to us. We fund intermediaries. We give the, those intermediaries grant money and they actually lend those dollars to the small business owner. And that's a, a, a godsend for a lot of small business owners because $5,000, $50,000, I mean, some may use a credit card, but this gives them an opportunity to, to get a loan, pay it back, and then kind of graduate to those larger loans. And how would you access the microloan? What, what are those entities look like? Well, we have um, several throughout the state, and uh, we have one in Livonia, we have one in Benton Harbor. If you go to our website, www.sba.gov backslash Michigan, um, it gives you a full list of all those micro lenders. And they're throughout the state, because we do cover the entire state. So there's a micro lender throughout the state that you can access our micro loan programs. SBA loans go through banks. Banks have multitudes of different products as well. But I think that there's a much larger story in terms of talking to a bank about a loan. It's about community and support. We, what do you do as a banker to really support the owner mm -hmm. through this process? So we, we encourage um, our business uh, you know, customers to, um, you know, to really develop a relationship with, uh, with the banker, with the, with the business banker, and I would encourage all small businesses uh, to do that. Even if a business is just starting out, maybe isn't yet qualified for bank, uh, uh, for bank financing, but banks can be a tremendous resource for businesses. They're not just there to lend money and collect interest. Um, they very much want to support that small business owner because they want to see them grow. It's good for the community, it creates jobs, it creates a good customer for the bank. So, you know, banks are, um, you know, teach their people to be a resource and help educate people, help direct them to resources that can be beneficial uh, to them. So build that relationship uh, with the banker. A good uh, business banker will be one of the most uh, important trusted relationships that a business owner can have along with say their accountant, their attorney, a number, uh, a number of others. Uh, but when it comes to raising money and managing money, you, you gotta have a, a really good banking relationship. I want to chime in with that if you don't mind. It, we say that a lot because we tell our small business owners as we do outreach, we do extensive outreach throughout the state. Form that relationship before you need the loan. You need to have that relationship with the banker because they kind of know your business, they know what your goals and objectives are. So form that relationship 
again, before you are in dire straits and you need a loan right away before you go out of business, for example. Right. That's a, that's a great example because I've, I've seen that multiple times throughout my career. Well, people all of a sudden, oh my gosh, I need money, and they race to the bank, and I need this yesterday, and they're in a tough spot at, at that point. They needed to have been, number one, anticipating these needs um, ahead of time and have starting to, to build a rapport and kind of plan plan for this. If somebody comes, uh, you know, rushing in and it's an emergency, they're in a, they're in a tough spot. Yeah. They really are. Yeah. And SBA doesn't make a bad deal good. So we encourage individuals to, you have to still be bankable. There's certain criteria that you have to have. So again, those relationships are critical. What are the criteria? Can you get specific about that? Well, the criteria most of the time starts with the banks. Mm -hmm. um, so, Tim, if you want to talk about yeah. what some of your criteria are. Sure. I, you know, I think the way that we underwrite loans and the way the SBA underwrites your guarantees is very, very similar, looking at mm -hmm. the same, uh, same criteria. So um, collateral, cash flow, super important. Um, you know, credit, uh, uh, credit history of the individuals involved, the character of the individuals involved. So there's a lot of similarities. Like you, like you said, the SBA guarantee doesn't make a bad situation good. And the SBA is very good at looking at, uh, you know, looking at a, at a loan request and, and deciding is this a good one right. or not. The, the hole that the, if you will, that the SBA fills is what if somebody doesn't have say a full down payment to, to purchase a, uh, a building or doesn't have a lot of, uh, you know, doesn't have a lot of capital. Maybe that cash flow isn't quite what the banks want to see it, but it's still positive, it's still good, and the SBA, you know, steps in and says, we want to we want to give this building or we want to give this business, a, you know, a helping hand. So, um, you know, down payment or the you know, equity investment of a business, very important. Um, cash flow yes. for banks, we live and die by this, by you know, by that. In character, including credit credit history, yeah. very very uh, important. But we look at other things, um, you know, management experience, succession planning, um, any number of uh, uh, of other things as well. That's great. All those things that Tim just mentioned, and we really look to make sure they can pay the loan back mm -hmm. again, going back to cash. Yeah, loan. you don't want to help somebody get in a bad, and a bank doesn't either. Right. You know, you don't want to help somebody get into a bad position. Right. You want to help, help them succeed. Yeah, you want to help them succeed. Buildings are a really common purchase for a second stage business. If you haven't purchased a building before, what is the order in which you do it? Do you talk to the banker, secure yourself some dollars in the price range where you think you're going to buy, or do you find a building and then go to your banker and talk to them about, I have the building, I know what I want to pay. What is the order that makes sense mm -hmm. for business owners that haven't purchased yet? Yeah. I would encourage them to go to the bank first and say, here's, you know, and the earlier the better. I'd like to buy my own building. I think this makes sense. It's an asset that I want to, uh, that I want to own over, you know, uh, buy over time uh, through financing. But sit down with the banker and say, here's how my business is doing. How much do you think it makes sense for me to go out and spend on a, on a building? How much do you think I could be approved for? Kind of go through what I'll call uh, a kind of a pre-approval process in a consultation process with the bank, um, and uh, um, and see what the you know see what the answer is, and they may raise some uh, some issues or some points, good or bad, that the business owner may not have thought about uh, previously. So, I would absolutely encourage all both business owners to go to the bank first. Yeah. I would say we have great resources at the SBA. We have counselors, the Small Business Development Center, SCORE. We have a Women's Business Center. So each scenario is different. So I would encourage them to meet with one of our counselors first because they may want to purchase a building, but maybe buying a building isn't right for that business at this time. Maybe the overhead may be too much. I, I absolutely agree. So Everybody thinks they want to buy sooner than yeah, later. It's very expensive. It is. Yeah, it, it ties up a lot of capital. Yes, I would say do your homework and work with our resources that are free, again, throughout the state, SBDC, Women's Business Centers, SCORE. If they go to our website, again, www.sba.gov backslash MI Michigan, um, tons of resources to help you kind of walk through that process. Right, right. So we're talking about loans. That is certainly a common way to need capital. What about lines of credit, mm -hmm. Tim? Uh, 
that's not really, it, it is a loan, but it's a it, different kind of it, thinking it, it, about how it, to right. get some financing for your company. Yeah. Sure, so a line of credit is a loan, but it's a, it's a completely different animal in a, in a different use, if you use correctly, than what I'll call a term loan, say to build, buy a building where you, you borrow a set amount of money and you pay it back with interest over time. Uh, a line of credit is designed for um, financing a need that might fluctuate uh, over time and that is recurring. So the classic example would be a business that builds something, uh, so they have to buy raw materials, they turn those raw materials into inventory, that inventory becomes accounts receivable, and then ultimately turns into cash. So that line of credit can go up and down as that process, uh, you know, as that process, um, as they go through that through that process, so um, it's something that uh, that is intended to be a permanent part of the financing of a company, but but fluctuating. So, are there costs associated with having a line of credit? What size line of credit is right for a company? Mm -hmm. How do you determine those things? Right. You know, every every business is different, um, but what a bank will look for is what is that fluctuating piece of their cash flow? What where is that gap that needs to be uh, that needs to be met. So, a really easy example would be take a um, take a farmer. You got to get you know in the, in the spring you got to go and you got to buy all your seed or whatever it is that you're going to plant. Very expensive. Um, so you might use a line of credit to to finance that. Then through the growing season you have a lot of overhead expenses to irrigate and do whatever you know fertilize and so forth. So that balance is going to continue to go up. The bank's going to look at what is that what is that need, and then in the fall you harvest. You, you know, uh, and you and you sell it, and you get the cash, and that, if handled right, that line of credit should go to zero, uh, and then the process starts over again. So the bank's going to look for what is that fluctuating need that then goes back down, over and uh, on over and over again, and that's the right way to use a, a line of credit. Yeah, and and to your point you mentioned earlier. Um, Inventory. If you are a contractor, for example, and you need to buy supplies, you can um, get a line of credit. So if you get a contract and you have to fund that contract, so you can access that line of credit to do that. So do you have to, in that case, would you bring a signed contract as collateral? You obviously don't have the cash in hand. You're somewhat mm -hmm. promising yes. sales on the other end of the loan. What, what kind of tools do you need to bring to the bank to get that line of credit? Well, I would say definitely if you have some pending contracts to show those contracts, that's certainly you can use it as collateral if it's certainly, you know, of course not a, a tentative contract, but a contract. Um, that's something that you can certainly use. I would ab absolutely encourage you to do that, to bring that. So oftentimes the, the product that's being, that's being generated, I'll call it, or the service uh, that might result in accounts, uh, accounts receivable, mm -hmm. that can be posted as collateral for that loan. So it depends on the nature of, uh, of the business. But a line of credit could also be um, secured by, the purpose not, might not be, say, to buy a building, but you could use a building to secure a line of credit, and it might be less expensive that way because it's a hard asset um, that a bank is going to look at as a more reliable piece of, uh, of collateral. Now, if you already have a mortgage on your building, then that's probably not going to be available, for, but for many businesses, if they own a hard asset, they can post that as collateral for the line of credit. The bank's going to be very, uh, they're going to like that a lot um, and probably keep the cost, uh, cost down. And then they don't have to come out and audit your books every month to see are those accounts receivable or is that inventory really there? So it's simpler for the business owner too, if it's an option. So let's, just to wrap it up, what is the best advice that you have for a business owner when it comes to capital? Mm -hmm. Well, from a banker's perspective, um, talk to your banker early and often establish that relationship. Find somebody that you really feel good about. Um, I would recommend try to start local. Uh, and we're talking about small businesses, so they're going to really understand that local local connection. So go go talk to your local uh, you know banker community. You know the, the 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 more tied into the community they are, the the more they're going to be interested in helping the small businesses uh, in in those communities. So build a relationship with your banker. Absolutely, I agree. I would say definitely come to the SBA because there's so many resources, and we really want you to understand really what you're getting into. You may need a micro loan. You may need an SBA guarantee. You, maybe you don't. So let's just help you walk through that process and understand the strategy. So I would say start with some experts that are at the SBA and we can certainly help you make some right choices. Thank you. This is great information. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you Thank for you. having us.
Once a company is properly capitalized, they can start thinking about how to properly budget and plan for technology. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of uh, things should we be thinking about there? Well, a big thing that people fall into is they're, they're thinking about doing it the same way they used to do it. And technology changes so quickly, we can't do that, or we shouldn't do that. Uh, thinking about a, a small company that has a server in their closet. You know, they've always had a server for the past 20 years, and now somebody says, hey, the server is getting old, we need to replace the server. Well, straight off the bat, you should not be thinking about replacing the server. You should be thinking strategically and saying, do we even need a server anymore because everything that the server used to do can now be done in some other way in the cloud. So we need to think long term, uh, not just that we need something today that's going to get us through next year because you make that investment in a server that should last five years. Well, let's not think about that. Let's think about how the technology is going to help us grow our company, not just a box sitting on the shelf. So the other thing people need to do is think long term. Okay, what, how, as I said, how can that technology help the organization grow? That's where we want to invest our money, not in the, in the other stuff. And the third thing that we see a trend in is, is these um, services. Okay, so you can rent software as a service today. You can, you can acquire equipment as a service, the phones, the mobile devices. Nobody thinks about that as we're going to go buy a bunch of mobile phones and we're going to stick stuff on there. It just, it's just a service. You go down to the Verizon store and you pick up what you want and you're not, buying the, you're not buying a device necessarily. You're buying the features that that device can deliver. And so we need to be thinking about that the same way. The desktops, the, um, the computers that people are using every day, all of those things can now be acquired as a service. So we don't have to spend $2,000 to buy that device to stick it on somebody's desk. We can just become a monthly payment. So this is a completely different way of thinking about um, making purchases. How long term should we be thinking? We, you know, a, a server was five years, now we're going to the cloud. What, what is that? Re when do you review what it is you're doing and thinking about yeah, making a we need to We need to review it every year, but we, we can only have like a three year timeline because technology changes so quickly and we don't know what's going to happen beyond the three years. Mostly we're thinking next year and the year before Got or the year after. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Focus on Tech, brought to you by Providence, making technology easier. Tim, I have a couple of more questions for you. As a banker, what do you need to assess a company's capital needs? Uh, first and foremost, uh, financial information. Bankers live and die um, with numbers. So solid, reliable, accurate, and timely financial information is absolutely critical. Traditional balance sheet, income statement, maybe a statement of cash flows, and projections for businesses that are looking uh, to grow as well. Very important. If a business is good at providing that financial information itself, great. If not, it should get some help from an accountant who can, who can do the job uh, well. Great. Uh, so how important is cash flow? Uh, it's not a number that everybody tracks as readily as a P&L, but how important is that in that conversation with a banker? Absolutely critical. Cash flow is what you pay your bills with, what you pay, make your, your loan payment with, pay your people with, so it's absolutely the most critical piece. And it's very different, um, cash flow to profit or loss is very, very different. So for example, you could be um, making a very good profit, but if your inventory is growing rapidly or your accounts receivable, if people aren't paying you on a timely basis, your cash flow could be negative. At the same time, on a P&L, you're making money. Also, a business that's expanding rapidly uh, will need a lot of cash. They might have to go out and buy equipment, facilities, finance a larger inventory, uh, larger accounts receivable. So cash flow and profits, two uh, very, very different things. And it's very critical uh, to, for a banker in a loan decision. So just real quick, a lot of folks don't know what the formula is. Can you tell us what is 
the cash flow. Yeah. Formula. So you're going to you're going to start with profit and loss, but then add back or uh, either subtract or add back changes in things like inventory, um, accounts receivable, um, purchases of major uh, you know of major assets or potentially the sale of major assets and financing, uh, and that's the you know that puts positive cash in, into the business. Great. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Focus on Banking, brought to you by Michigan Bankers Association. Denise, there's a host of new kinds of non-traditional lending options, uh, things like Cabbage, all kinds of crowdfunding sites. Uh, what are the risks associated uh, from a legal perspective? Um, interestingly, uh, although these are also loans, they're definitely loans, and they're so much more convenient uh, for some of us, especially when we started our businesses, than, than going to the bank. Um, there are some few risks to them. You are going to have generally a personal guarantee. You're going to give them all of your bank account information. You're going to sign a loan document. But um, with these loans, generally the self-help or the, the way that they get their money back if you default on your loan is generally access to your bank account. They're not generally taking uh, for the most part a security interest in your entire business. So they're not gonna come get you're a whole business if you default. And that's one of the ways there's actually an advantage to these loans, uh, in addition to them being streamlined. Online loans, they're, you, in the more traditional sense, you can go online and get yourself a loan. What are some of the advantages and disadvantages of an online loan? Well, an online loan is gonna be, um, you know, you're gonna wanna read all the fine print. So you're not gonna probably have the personal service that you have with a traditional loan, having your banker talk you all the way through it. You're sort of on your own. So you're gonna to need to be astute enough to be reading that online document and knowing that you're just usually not taking a line of credit. It's usually a loan every single time, generally six month loans. There's not a whole lot of difference in, in the um, percentages that they're charging in the interest, but you will need to know that there's a whole lot of self-help and the one disadvantage that you're gonna have online is that a lot of these companies are not in your state. So if you're defaulting, you're going to be having your dispute resolution maybe in California or maybe in Nevada where you are not. So you're going to need to go there and hire an attorney from California to represent you. That can be more expensive than a loan itself. So it Great. may be a disadvantage. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you meet the payments. So get to know your banker. Absolutely. Yeah, okay, <laughs> thank you. Focus on Law, brought to you by Policella and Associates, PLLC. Thank you all for joining us today on Show Me the Money. 